We're recording this in October of 1994. We're talking with Richard Chapin, who is the longtime president of Stewart Broadcasting, who's a member of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame, served twice as the Nebraska Broadcasters Association president, and was the only Nebraskan to serve as the chair of the joint boards of the National Association of Broadcasters. Dick, let's talk about uh, the early days in terms of broadcasting. How did you get started in broadcasting, and when was it? Well, I was in 1953, and I was working as the assistant manager of the Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, and uh, I was running the membership division and some other things. And I remember Arch Bailey was the head of the chamber in those days, very well-renowned uh, chamber man, and he indicated to me that people really made the money in sales and he had brought in a new person to take over part of my responsibilities and uh, I guess it kind of upset me and that that week um, the George X Smith who was formerly the head of the Stewart Insurance Company moved out to run KFOR and at that time the beginning of KFOR TV called me and asked me if I'd like to sell radio for KFOR so I went out and visited with him and heeding my mentor's advice about getting in sales, I decided I was going to do it because I was mad. And so that's the fork I took in the road and how I got into broadcasting. I went there as a salesman. I was there about six months and was made sales manager in September of 53. And then in December, I replaced George Smith as the manager. Um, we had started KFOR TV at that time. I think that yet today, that's the only television station, a VHF television station in the United States that ever went dark. What was it like to have both the radio and the television stations going simultaneously and selling for them? Well, we didn't, we just didn't sell anything on television. That was before the, uh, we had network. We didn't have a network in Lincoln. Uh, things were on, uh, uh, not on tape then. Uh, we had to scramble to provide local programming. We had one camera. What we had was good, we just didn't have much. I remember so well that I worked for months and months to get, I think it was the National Bank of Commerce to sponsor the newscast on television. We got him on, and the very first night it was on, I had the ad manager out to my office, and the cameraman was out there, and we only had one camera. And they went to, with the intro, and then they faded and was coming in, and everything went dark. And all I could hear was the cameraman, give me some cord. And the, the guy on the crew said, we haven't got any more damn cord. And yet, when they finally got on television, it took me months to get them off of television again back in the radio. How was the decision made to, uh, <coughs> to delete the television license? Very quickly, I was running down the street, and we had a sales office in the Stewart building at 13th and O, and the insurance manager came out working for the Stewart Insurance Company. And he said, uh, Dick, Mr. Stewart wants to talk to you. So I called him. He said, what do you need? What do you got on the air tonight? I said, well, we got a news, and then we got a film. And he said, what do you got after that? And I said, nothing. He said, well, when it's over, just turn it off. I said, what do you mean turn it off? He said, just turn it off. And that was the end. But he had agreed to sell Channel 10 to John Fetzer, who had bought Channel 12 in Lincoln. John Fetzer, being a very brilliant man, decided to give his channel and all of his Dumont television gear to the University of Nebraska if they would make that channel an educational channel. So he forever put away any competition for a commercial television station. And so we sold our equipment and stuff. I maintained the building, and I know it was a very sad day when they were taking everything out of the offices and stuff. But we pulled ourselves by the bootstraps. Uh, that was in 1954. Um, I think the day I took over, or, or that, that that happened, we had about $7,000 worth of business on KFOR, which incidentally wasn't enough to pay the bills. What was, your, what was your job title then in relationship to the radio and the television stations? Well, I was general manager at that time, but I really don't think I was ever general manager of television. I, I was at the demise, but I wasn't, you know, uh, simultaneously running both of them. Ken Greenwood, who later went on to 
do some teaching at the University of Tulsa, was very successful in the radio business, then developed a very good sales training course, still around today, was the program director at KF4, and I was the sales manager. What was radio like then in the uh, in the 1950s when television was coming in? What was KFOR radio like? What was radio like generally in Nebraska? Well, I suppose if I'd have been smart, I'd have probably not got into radio because I think they were playing taps for radio. Uh, everybody felt that radio would just uh, just fade away and, and, and be very bad. Um, we also, when I went to work at KFOR, had an FM station, uh, KFOR FM which was a low-power FM station. And I remember my first job in radio was to sell time on that FM station. We were carrying Western League baseball on an FM station with nobody having FM sets. And I had to go out and sell. My first, first sale was to a fellow here in Lincoln by the name of Ollie Christensen of the Christensen Appliance people. And I sold him some time on baseball. I was real proud of that. What was the Ames group of the radio broadcasters at that time? Well, the Ames group was a group that was started by Todd Storrs and, and Gordon McClendon. The two of those gentlemen probably were the pioneers of what we know as, as rock radio, top 40 radio. Uh, Todd Storrs owned uh, a 660 frequency in Omaha, KOWH, which stood for the Omaha World Herald. And uh, he just got a concept that young people wanted to hear music and nothing else, and they were going to they were going to do that. That was at a time when network radio still had a presence and so they formed the organization as the Association of Independent Metropolitan Stations which primarily was to compete with network radio and there were a group of people and it's evolved over the years. I got into the group in the, the early 60s through a friend of mine Harold Krellstein who then was president of Plow Radio Obviously, Lincoln is, was not considered a metropolitan station in those days. So it was because of my association work and knowledge of people that he got me into the group. And now I'm still in it, and I've been chairman probably for the last 10 years. And there are 11 members, I think, at the present time. We meet three times a year and discuss uh, promotional items and sales items and things like that. We have to make presentations. I think we represent about 70 radio stations. But there are a couple of guys that own television in it, and they're getting kind of noisy, and I always have to remind them that they're on borrowed time because it was a radio organization. How did uh, Todd Storrs uh, um, fit into this group of people in the 50s in terms of radio? I, uh, I, di I didn't uh, participate at that time, so I don't know. But he was such a, a go-getter and such a pioneer at the time that I'm sure that uh, that he kept everybody's interest up and kept them on their toes. Now, early on in your career, you served as the president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association, I think in 1956. What, was, what can you remember about the way that the association operated in those days in terms of representing radio and television broadcasters in the state? Well, maybe a little ego-oriented, but I remember I went to my first broadcasters meeting, I think, in 1954 and I think it was Norfolk, Nebraska. I'm not sure about that. And uh, Perry Burke was the president of Nebraska Broadcasters, I think, from KFAB in Omaha. And I thought that being an ex-chamber man, I was still a young man, being an ex-chamber man and used to organization stuff, I thought this was the most loosely knit, disorganized bunch of guys I ever met. And I thought, well, I'm going to take over this group and get some discipline in it. So that was 54, and two years later I was elected president because I did, I just went after that and thought we, you know, as a group we could be powerful in our lobbying efforts. And I was, um, you know, I was kind of a maverick. I, I really was for radio because I'd been taken out of television, and so I wanted radio survived. And we started right away to do well in radio. I was able to go out and recruit uh, Roger Larson who came to work for me and with me as a um, salesperson and then later I got a gentleman by the name of Gay Cole who was public relations director for LG National Watch and then later a fellow by the name of Vince Calera who was a sales manager at Latch Brothers here in Lincoln. We all came from various walks of life and, and uh, were uh, brought together through the 
Lincoln Junior Chamber, which at that time was a very active junior chamber. It was the second largest chapter in the United States and was winning all kinds of national awards for our organization and things. So that's kind of how it all started. And with those people, we just started building KFOR, and it wasn't very long before I was in talking to Jim Stewart about buying another station. And it's a wonder it didn't throw me out of my ear, but uh, at the time when television was flourishing, but we were making progress, and he could see that, so he let me buy one. When did you move from uh, being the uh, individual primarily with responsibilities for KFOR, the local station, into the corporate office as president of Stuart Broadcasting? Well, I just gave this talk to a fellow the other day about trying to form a group, and I told him that uh, I ran KFOR as the manager, and then we bought Grand Island, Nebraska, and I hired a manager, but the station reported to me. Then I bought Salina, Kansas, and the manager reported to me, but I was still running care for. It wasn't until we added Sioux City, Iowa as our fourth station that I relinquished my job as manager of KFOR and moved into just the group office and had the four managers in reporting me. It was a matter of economics, how much money we were generating, what does it take to run a home office, etc. Um, I'll brag a little bit here, but I've lived long enough, thank goodness, that uh, uh, some of the people around the country that I got acquainted with through the National Association, now looking back on time, um, are coming to me um, on many occasions asking about how we ran the group, how we controlled expenses, how we let them operate. And I'll, I'll say unabashedly, I think we were one of the best, best run groups in America. And I think that a lot of people would tell you that we were the best run, run small market group in the country. And I guess I'd put myself up against uh, Taft or Great American and Cap Cities and the rest of them. Well, it went into the decision making to buy radio stations at a time that it was not popular to expand and buy radio stations. I guess it was just a feeling that we could do it. Um, we saw it happening in Lincoln. We saw good salesmanship, persuasiveness with advertisers. And I thought, well, if it'll work here, it'll work someplace else. And of course, we made really, really prudent, good buys. I mean, we bought, I bought the Grand Island radio station for $150,000. We paid $50,000 down and they carried me for five years at no interest. Why, you know, today you, you can't even buy a, the land for that. Approximately, when was that? I, I'm guessing now, I, I have all this someplace in my archives. It was, it was the, the late, uh, 50s or early 60s, 60, 60, 61, something like that. In terms of the uh, the evolution, the development of the radio arm of the Stewart organization, how how did the cash flow, the profit motive for the radio stations, how did you fit those against the other kinds of interests? Uh, you're on the board of the bank, for example. As far as our company was concerned, yeah. well, I, I think that uh, the radio business, uh, as far as the Stewart family is concerned, really made made them. When I went to work uh, in 53, they owned the Stewart building, which was a not, not a profitable situation. Being a big building like that, it was cost a lot of money to operate. They owned an insurance office, so it made some money each year. Um, and uh, the, Mr. Stewart at that time owned 20% of the old trust company, first trust company of Lincoln. And he also owned a considerable amount of the Continental National Bank stock. But through a series of moves in which the Continental Bank was merged with the, um, uh, the old uh, uh, First National, and then the trust company was merged with the National Bank of Commerce, that's how Mr. Stewart got his stock in the in National Bank of Commerce was by the exchange of stock for the trust company. Well, of course, then he was acquiring stock in the National Bank of Commerce, where he and his family own about 62% of that stock today, which is a big organization. And uh, the radio station was providing all the funds, all the money to buy that stock. After the purchase of the station in Grand Island, what were the other stations purchased in the group? Well, like I say, we bought Grand Island, and we bought Salina, Kansas, and we bought Sioux City, Iowa. Then I think we bought North Platte, uh, then we bought Springfield, Illinois. Uh, then we bought Old Wine, Iowa, uh, which I might pause here to say that Old Wine, Iowa is a town of 7,800 people. 
and it still today has a reputation. It certainly did at our time that we were the highest billing, most profitable small market radio station in the United States, and people didn't even know where it was. And then we bought Springfield, Illinois. I mean, Springfield, Missouri. So that was, we sold off North Platte, we sold off Sioux City, eventually sold off Springfield, Illinois. So when I, uh, when the company was sold in 1985, we had uh, Lincoln, Grand Island, Salina, uh, Springfield, Illinois, and, uh, and Owen, Iowa. You mentioned it was, uh, the company was very successful in terms of markets of a given population size. How was the decision made to, to center the attention on markets of that particular size? Well, I, mean, I can remember having many visits with Mr. Stewart about it. We used to ram around a little bit together, and I'd go up to his place in Minnesota and hunt, and we'd visit about things. And uh, I remember he was encouraging me in those days, to say, why don't we get into a Dallas, Texas or someplace? And I can remember saying that, uh, why do I want to be in Dallas, Texas and pay the money that it costs to go into that market and maybe be successful, but certainly could have a chance of not being successful. And when I can go to Grand Island, Nebraska and make more money than the fourth rated station in Dallas, Texas, because at that time I knew what they were doing and stuff and made sense to him. So we just kind of left it at that. When you look for a station to buy on behalf of the corporation, what kind of stations came to, to attention? I think we drew a circle on a map of about how long it would take us to get there with an airplane in a couple of hours and said, well, let's just stay within this circle. And as it turned out, they were all, you know, fairly small markets within that circle. Uh, and that basically I was determined because we later had a corporate airplane, a corporate pilot, I had a small corporate staff, and we flew to our radio stations all, every week, all week long. I mean, I was in the radio stations every two weeks, visiting them and working with them and so on and so forth. What, uh, what was a good rate of profit for a radio station in the 1950s? I, I really couldn't give you an answer. I don't remember. People have asked, how did you make the judgment to buy that station? What was your formula criteria? At that time, I think we used to look at it and say, you know, it's a multiple of how much business are we doing. The, the term cash flow never was in our vocabulary until I think the late 70s or early 80s. Um, and now everything is in terms of cash flow, but uh, we didn't think of it that way. I used to look at a station and say, that's a good market. That looks like a good station. I think I can do as much as they're doing. Feeling in my heart I could do better, but not wanting to trust it to that. We can buy it and we can pay for it. Now you mentioned a little while ago there was a KFOR FM at the time that you were first starting in the business. What, uh, what's the history of KFOR FM? Well, we sold that. We, uh, we shut the FM down. It was losing money. And I sold the transmitter to the United States Dew Line system, an early warning system they had up in Alaska. They used the transmitters for... I don't know how they used them, but they did. And so we went out of the FM business, as a lot of people did. Very few people were in the FM business that continued it from then until television or until FM got popular. When, when was that that the station was shut down, approximately? I think yet in 53. Hmm. When did it come on the air? Uh, I can't answer that, but I think it was probably 52, because the transmitter was practically new, I remember that. It was an operation when you joined the company. Right. Um, and then we sat here and watched the FM frequencies um, be obtained. And I kept saying, you know, when FM is popular, we'll get in it. And it kept going on and going on. And one day I looked around and the, all the frequencies were taken. And uh, a radio station, which used to be KOLN radio, became KLIN, had filed for the last remaining frequency in Lincoln. Uh, so then I decided I'd file on that too, which you could do. So it was going to be a, a hearing and so on and so forth. So I tried to make a deal with him. I said, well, there's another frequency available to Lincoln, but they moved it to Omaha, and nobody's got it in Omaha. So I, was, I had been president of the National Broadcasters, or I was in line to be president at the time. So I had a lot of, a lot of connections. So I went back to Washington and said, why don't you move that frequency back to Lincoln? So they said they would. So it came back to Lincoln. 
So then I said to the then manager over there, I said, well, let's flip a coin and whoever wins will stay on the application we got filed and the loser will get on the new one coming back. No, no, I can't do that. I'm here already. So I guess like a fool, I decided I'd get off and let them have it. So then I filed for the new frequency. And as soon as I filed for the new frequency, there was another group here in town that had a low power FM and they wanted it. So they filed on top of me. And these comparative hearings get pretty touchy. It turned out that the, the uh, broadcasting judge in the matter had come from Havelock, a suburb here of Lincoln. So he was pretty familiar with Lincoln. And he realized the Stewart family owned the Stewart building and banks and billboard companies and everything else. And these were the poor little guys. I could see over the first day of hearings that we might as well pack our bags and go home. So we did. So we were out. And so then I bought an FM from um, a fellow over there that owned Baker Printing Company. And uh, we bought it from him at $475,000. So that then became again KFOR It, it emerged and, and became KFOR, I forget what the first, uh, KHKS I think was some call letters I came up with, which was Jim Stewart's wife's initials. And it didn't mean anything to, to anybody, uh, not that they do. And I finally come across uh, KFRX uh, was a call letter assigned to a Navy boat and I got it uh, because I wanted the X. We called it X-103 when it started. Now, we talked about in our introduction, you mentioned your relationship to the National Association of Broadcasters. The National Association of Broadcasters is the parent for all the state organizations or it's the national organization that represents radio and television stations in this country. And it has two parallel boards, radio board and television board, but the Paramount elected office, as I understand it, at the time that you were there and, and still as the chairman of the joint boards. But take us a little bit through your career at the National Association of Broadcasters, please. Well, having served as president of the Nebraska Broadcasters, I guess I got a taste for organizational work, and I had been in that. And I thought, well, you know, we were doing something statewide. Nebraska at that time had a very enviable position with the National Association for its backing. We had great broadcasters here, Les Hilliard from Scottsbluff, John Alexander from North Platte, uh, Bob Thomas from Norfolk, uh, Bud Pence from Beatrice, a very long time, broadca uh, long time broadcasters who really cared about the industry and the business. And so we had a good reputation. So I thought, well, hey, you know, maybe I'll run for that office. So I ran for one of the district directorships and uh, got elected. So I went on the board and I went back there and saw the same thing that I'd seen when I first came to the Nebraska meetings, that there was a little disorganization and so on and so forth. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just a kid from the cornfields of Nebraska, but I know as much about broadcasting as that guy over there. So I started working at it. And uh, then it evolved. Uh, I was elected, you can be elected one term. I was elected for a second four, year, four years, I think it was. So I'd been on eight years. Then you have to go off. And so I went off. And then I came back and reemerged as a director at large. And I was on there again. And uh, there was a fellow by the name of uh, Bill Walbridge who worked for a big TV station in uh, Houston. And he was the joint chairman at the time. I had, I had elevated myself and got put on the executive committee as chairman of the radio board. So I held that office at one time. And um, then I came off of that. And so I had some uh, prominence with some of the people. And so Bill Rodridge was the joint chairman. And uh, they were coming up for the election. I was on the board. And they, they kind of had an unwritten rule that, that uh, they would try to alternate between radio and television as the joint chairman. And so uh, he'd been on and been reelected for two years. And he called me up and uh, visited with me and said, we'd like to have you run for chairman. I said, oh, gee, I, yeah, I never ever thought of that. And that'd take a lot of time and everything. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, I'll do it. And so uh, I was elected. The day I was elected, I had a kidney stone attack in the Hilton Hotel where President Reagan was shot in Washington and flew home, wasn't even at the election. And then they wanted me to move to Washington. They had a, um, a uh, condo at the Watergate. 
And I said, no, I'll come back as often as you need me, but I'm not going to put up residence here. Uh, Washington is an intriguing place. Uh, in that particular office, you get caught up in the swirl of things. Uh, invited to the White House, uh, in on all the gala parties that they have there for people. And you're of some prominence, and I can see how people would get enamored with the Potomac fever and stuff. But I made up my mind I'd do my job and do it like I thought it was supposed to be, and when it was over, it was over. I got off the bus, and now when I get on, I sit at the back of the bus. When you um, recall those responsibilities with the NAB, what do you recall about some of the connections with the government, the Federal Communications Commission, the commissioners, the senators? I had a great relationship. Dean Birch was chairman of the FCC at the time, um, and I was always trying to get something done. And I thought that the broadcast business was living in a lot of onerous, antiquated, archaic rules that didn't apply to modern-day science. For instance, it said that if you were an operator of a radio board, a broadcaster, that you had to be able to look through a window and see the dials on the uh, transmitter. I thought, how ridiculous can that be? I mean, if we can talk to a guy on the moon, why is that necessary? And so... I had Dean Birch come out here to Lincoln in September or whatever year it was, and, made, and I made a speech about deregulation and what I thought should happen. My idea was that we would have a hotline going into Washington, and if a broadcaster was worried about something was happening to him or that he'd violated a rule, that he could call the hotline, get an answer, and get a correction. And so I thought that'd be a great deal. So Dean Birch was here, listened to the speech, and asked me to come to Washington and see him. So I went back with a buddy of mine, uh, Andy Ockershausen, who was the head of the Evening Star television radio station. We had a lunch together, and Dean said, Shape, I like your idea, but he said, you know, I'll ever every common cause group in the world I'll owe my ears if we set up a special one. What you need to do if you want to change this, I'll appoint a committee, and you appoint a committee of broadcasters. And between the two of you, form a committee and start on this. And we did. And his later successor, Dick Wiley, was chief counsel of the FCC at the time. So he appointed Dick to the committee and four other people, and I appointed some broadcasters. And we started meeting, and we'd bring in a list of rules that we thought were crazy, and they'd go off and look at them, come back and say, you're right, we're going to knock out all. I think uh, in a period of time, we eliminated some 560, 70 rules that were ridiculous, which what I thought was re-regulation, I called it deregulation. But then after our stint was over and we had done our job, somebody picked up the flag and went on with it and they did a lot more things with the with the rules that I think really affected broadcasters that were not the technical things that I think were injurious to radio. What sort of things um, do you think that the uh, National Association of Broadcasters should do in terms of uh, that kind of representation for government? Well, I think they're doing that. I think the, it, uh, the, for a long time we suffered that we did not, I think, have the clout on the hill that an industry with all its power that we had with radio and television, its exposure, its insight to things, I thought we had a lot of clout and we weren't using it. It wasn't, it wasn't harnessed right. But in the last uh, uh, five to eight years, I think uh, Eddie Fritz... Um, uh, who's head of it and his committee have really done an outstanding job and they've got a lot of things done. You mentioned uh, the Federal Communications Commission Chairman Dean Birch and, uh, and Richard Wiley. Uh, what, uh, what role does the FCC chairman have? What kind of leadership, what kind of persuasive powers do they have? Well, I think they, uh, they have a lot of influence, of course, on the other commissioners and everything gets down to votes just like everything else. And... Um, I think that it, the, the commission sort of follows her lead. Like I say, after our rulemaking, I think Fowler came along that time. And Fowler was very, uh, uh, I don't know, loose in my estimation of what he wanted to do. He formulated the what they now call the 80-90 docket, in which he said, more is better. And so with that stroke of the pen and, and getting the commissioners to go along with him, they have allowed some eight, nine hundred thousand radio stations on the FM band to come into being, which I think was wrong. I thought it was wrong at the time, still think it was wrong. 
And now the FCC, through its infinite wisdom, is trying to correct that by allowing ownership of more stations than ever in history and by allowing what we call duopoly arrangements, where now in Lincoln, Nebraska, you can own two AMs and two FMs, which that never would have happened before. If the 8090 docket hadn't been adopted, there would have been no reason. So I, I think it was wrong. They're trying a corrective measure, which I think is going to give them in a bind, and somewhere down the road we're going to see uh, some people jumping up and down about what's going on, then how they're going to correct it, I don't know. In your experience uh, at that time, how well connected are the FCC commissioners, and especially the chairman, with the presidential administration? Well, I don't think they are really connected. We had changes in administration and at the time. Uh, Dean Birch was a Republican. Dick Wiley was a Republican. Um, I think they're adversarial in some some respects. Um, the FCC trying to do its job too, and a need for more money and and budgets like that was always up on the hill, trying to get some. And then of course we get into the First Amendment rights, and that's an issue I don't even want to talk about. But that gets into play about what can be and what can't be done. It comes up and foments and gets up here and then they kick it out and it falls down and comes back again. What other FCC commissioners besides those two can you recall were influential? Well, Newton Minow was influential in his great vast wasteland speech that he made about television, that it was a vast wasteland, there was nothing there. Uh, he, had a, he, had a, he made a big mark. Um, I wouldn't say it was a good one, but he had a he made a big mark on the commission, and I, I guess after Dick Wiley, we were very, uh, we were very close personal friends. Dick Wiley and I became that way, and um, I had a lot of relationship with him. I found him to be a brilliant man, and uh, he's gone on, got his own uh, legal firm in Washington, and is a leader in many, many causes uh, for broadcasting. But I don't really had, much, I haven't had much contact with the commissioners since then. When you get out of the when you get out of the picture, you kind of get out of the way. Then I became active in the radio advertising bureau, and then I became active in the network side of radio. I became head of the ABC uh, affiliates group, ABC radio affiliates group. Talk a little bit how the affiliates group um, has some rapport with the network. In terms of well, I think today that that's practically non-existent, um, and that was an era too in the '70s when. Um, the, net, the networks would want to do things. They would want to take more time, or they'd want to do this, or they'd want to do that. And uh, they wanted the affiliates always to give its blessing. Well, ABC was a pioneer, of course, in, in the multiple network thing. They early on decided. Ralph Bodine, a former Nebraskan, is the, is the guy that developed that concept. I remember him telling me that on a bus in Williamsburg, Virginia, one day about how he was going to do that. And what he did was divide the clock up into four parts, and he had the network, because it was by line, he had four different networks, and they would broadcast in this hour. And uh, he wondered what I thought, and I said, well, it's a brilliant idea if you can get it done to the FCC. Well, he did. Then it, later on, when you got to satellite, well, you could have more networks. I don't know how many they got now, probably seven, eight, or something like that. A network has a certain kind of music and program. And, uh, so they, they needed the blessing of the affiliates, and so they would try to run stuff by the by affiliates to get it done before they, they did it. Usually they'd make up their mind, and if it worked, okay. Uh, but then with the satellite thing and, the, and, and just music box for some of them, I think, uh, and then ABC was bought by Cap Cities, and uh, Cap Cities was uh, the little guy eating the big, and uh, they were pretty close with the bucks. and. They just sort of, as far as I know, I don't know anything about the affiliate organizations anymore. Talk about the Radio Advertising Bureau. You've been a leader in that for many years. Well, uh, I thought that, uh, that I should get into an organization that was for the betterment of radio. And I started back in the 60s with uh, the then head of the group called uh, Kevin Sweeney, who's still out there today doing some consulting with three or four stations. Probably the best radio salesman I've ever been around, a great uh, showman and everything else, great guy. And uh, we went through a number of people. Then 
then there was a then there's a big division between what the big markets want because big markets are driven by ratings and their advertising as a result of ratings and the little markets who are driven by local contacts with local merchants and so it's tough to keep both of them together and we floundered from time to time with people and uh, about two years ago maybe three years ago now uh, we were needing a new uh, head of the group and Gary Fries who was started with me at KFR and later ran KRGI and Grand Island for us uh, emerged as somebody they were interested in and I was on the executive committee and we were voting on the on the new president and I remember being in a conference call and I was in the red carpet room in Denver at the time and uh, everybody was on the line and not one person had a negative thing to say about Gary which I thought was amazing because in this business with multiple ownerships you have groups and because you have groups you have guys that are competing in certain markets both these guys own stations in Columbus Ohio or they both own stations in Philadelphia so if you like somebody chances are they don't like somebody but nobody said anything against me and he's ra rode the crest of the wave for some three years now I've done the best job I know of any head of the group. Gary Fries, like you are, is a member of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. He really owes his career in radio to you in many ways in terms of starting up. How did you give him the opportunity to manage Grand Island at um, what a very young age, as I recall? Well, uh, Gary had been on the street here uh, part-time as a salesperson and he emerged as a very good salesperson. Of course, I always chose my managers from the sales side, not from the program side. And uh, I remember I I had an opening down in Salina and I wanted him to go. So I, I thought, loved Salina, Kansas. I thought it was a great town, but he'd do a good job. And I guess his wife, Linda, uh, went down with him and they looked at Salina and she said, I don't want to live here. It's a nice town, but she just thought it was a long way. So they came back and I was a little bit upset about it. And I thought, well, I won't give him a chance. But anyhow, something developed in Grand Island. and. So I asked him to go out there and take a look, and he did, and he said he liked it. And I've talked to, I talked to Gary frequently, and I talked to him the other day, and he says, you know, Dick, that was the best job I ever had. I was important in Grand Island, Nebraska. And I think that, that, that has a lot to do with people. But Gary was a very young man when you let him become the manager there. How old was he, approximately? I was in his I late recall. 20s, maybe mid-20s. Well, I was 30 when I took over KFOR, so I guess when you look back, we were all... I remember when I was elected chairman of the National Association of Broadcasters, Saul Tashoff, who was the then editor of Broadcast Magazine, had an article and he says, Young Turks take over. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, he thought I was a young Turk. Now, after you achieved a great deal of prominence as the uh, only Nebraskan to become the chair of the National Association of Broadcasters Joint Boards, and as you say, you moved on from that sort of thing, but you got an award from the National Association of Broadcasters as, in, in terms of your outstanding service. What was that award? Oh, it was a Distinguished Service Award that's awarded by the association. I got that in 1974, and uh, it was quite an honor. I think I was really the first true broadcaster that had gotten it. Bob Hope had gotten it, and the head of the networks, the president of ABC and CBS, and people like that had always received that award and I guess I was really the first true broadcaster that got. I still have the speech that I made at that presentation down in 1974 in fact I saw it the other day and I was going to send it to the National Trades and say read this and see if it's still apropos I think it's almost to the letter the same type of thing we're fighting for today as I was there I was given the FCC a little little haircut at the time and I remember Dick Wiley and all of his commissioners were sitting in the first row kinda of wondered how it'd go after it was over but they were always kind to me. Now after you served in the national office you did come back again one time and become president of the Nebraska Broadcasters Association again in 1979 which uh, indicates I guess some dedication to the state as well as to the national concerns but how did you how did you find the state experience again after having had the national opportunity? Well I guess when I came back I, uh, some of the, the old boys were beginning to fade out of the picture and I saw a, a uh, change in the state organization 
you know, maybe stubbornness is a good word, but some of those old guys held out for things and, you know, steadfast, whether right or wrong, but they held out for things. And I saw that kind of waning, and I, I wasn't ready to quit. I'd just come off a, a high of all these organizations and lots of activity and flying to Washington and doing all those things. So I thought, well, they were looking for somebody. They didn't have anybody kind of in line, and so I thought, well, I'll just see if they want me again, and I'll give them another year's time because it was worth it to me, I thought. How do you assess broadcasting in Nebraska in all the years that you've been part of it. You mentioned earlier that broadcasting uh, had a good reputation as far as the national organization was concerned. How do you assess uh, your your friends, your colleagues, your competitors in the business in the years that you've been in Nebraska compared to other states that you've seen as a national leader? Well, I think that uh, some of the pioneers that I mentioned earlier were, uh, they had good reputations. Maybe some of them weren't as well known as they could be because we're from Nebraska, but I knew them and I knew people from other states and I would put up their principles and what they strove to, uh, strive to do against anybody. Let's talk about a few of those people. Um, um, let's talk about Bob Thomas. What do you recall about Bob Thomas as a colleague and, and friend? Bob was a, a true broadcaster in every sense of the word. I mean, he, he was born into a broadcast family. He fought for his rights, individualism, and uh, he just he's a great guy. How about Harold Sutherland? Harold Sutherland was, uh, I met him the first time. Harold was, was the sales manager at KFAB. Later decided to get into to broadcasting, and he came to me and asked me, and he bought this station up in Omaha, and we talked about it, and he had some tough days with it and stuff. And then I helped Harold get into the business because I formed a group, the Nebraska Hometown Radio Group, which we were going to sell in competition to Omaha Station. And that was comprised of Lincoln, North Fork, Grand Island, uh, North Platte, and Scotts Bluff. And we needed somebody to represent us by that. I mean, sell for us in the Omaha market and maybe Kansas City. So I asked Harold if he'd like to do that, and he said he would. And so Harold did it, and we became good friends out of that, and he did an excellent job. Les Hilliard. Les Hilliard was a guy that uh, was kind of like a granddaddy in Nebraska broadcasting. I, he was uh, in his late 50s or 60s when I first came along. I used to bunk with him at the national conventions. I, uh, I, I loved him for his principles and his, uh, his devotion to radio. He just, he loved radio. He had a great station in Scotts Bluff. He took real pride in the facility. He bought a, he built a great facility out there. He did a real community job in radio. And, and a lot of that is gone today. And that's what I think is maybe one of the, the ills of radio, is they, they are not, some of these people that own them or run them do not take that responsibility and do not inject themselves into the mainstream of the community and try to make an impact like I think they should. I still think they're an important force. Uh, Bud Pence. Bud was an individualist, and that's all I can say. I can see him yet with his flowing mustache and his Prince Albert coat and everything. Boy, he was a, he was a principled person and, a, a, again, a very, very strong personality did a great job in his radio station, did a great community job. You either liked Bud or you didn't like him. I liked him. Jody Natale. Oh, of course, Joe is one of my favorite people. Ran one of my radio stations in North Platte. I gave him the opportunity. He'd never had a chance to run a radio station. Uh, Joe was a great sportscaster, uh, well-known in sports circles. Had a, you know, just had a great memory for detail and things. Very principled, uh, very, very structured in his approach. Did a good job for me in running North Platte. Lyle Brimser. Lyle, I didn't know Lyle very well. Lyle was a, uh, before his stint as manager, was a performer, an on-air performer. Um, he ran a, a great pair of radio stations. Um, did an excellent job in Omaha. Um, 
I think became a real force in his community like I think people should, kept very much to himself. He didn't uh, mix and mingle much with Nebraska broadcasters. He ran his station, did his thing. Of course, um, Lyle had some physical problems. It wasn't as easy for him to get around. But uh, yeah. you talk about being honest and true, he really was one. David Young of Sydney. Well, David was uh, the same kind, type of fellow. Um, and uh, I remember when he took over as president of the association, I said, I'll work for you. And he succeeded you. you, actually, didn't he? I think he was the next one, yeah. I told him, I'll work with you and help you and, and so on and so forth. And he did a good job. He, again, was one of those people that he was Mr. Sydney, Nebraska. People knew him and knew what he stood for. And I, that, that's what I think it's about. See, I think radio in those days and the radio managers, even at the time when I came along, were important people in the community. And people looked up to them and followed them and their ideas and their thoughts and stuff. Of course, you, you know, I got into the editorial business in our stations and felt that we should take editorial stands, which we did for a long time. Of course, then after I got out of the company, I don't think they kept it up. And I don't think hardly anybody does it today. But I think, I think they should do that think they should have position. Newspapers do. Why can't we? How did, how did that work in terms of the editorials? Was that, how was that received by the audience when your stations uh, had them? I think very well. We used to, every once in a while, I told the managers with us, you have to do two editorials a week. And I said, don't try to talk about, uh, you know, uh, the Middle East or talk about Cuba or things like that because people will know you don't know anything about it. Talk about things in your own backyard. Talk about something that happened at the city council last week where they said you have to fence in your swimming pools to keep young people from falling in them. Are you for that? Are you against it? If you're against it, why? If you're for it, why? Give your reasons. Pick controversial issues and take positions. And, of course, then if the people didn't like it, they called the station. We gave them equal time. Well, I couldn't be happier. I wanted both sides to be represented. Get people thinking. Why was that not prevalent in other stations in your judgment? I don't know. I guess they were uh, afraid of the equal time, which was a facade as far as I'm concerned. What's wrong with having to give equal time if you take a position? You know, that's what it's about. Now, you indicated, as I understand it, that you asked the managers to editorialize twice a week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that... No, I didn't ask him. I told him. Okay. <laughs> the, question, the question then, I guess, that's even better, Dick. The question is, how does the, the goals or the personal ideas of somebody in your position, the corporate president, for example, or the general manager, how is that reflected in the way that the station operates? What's the station's personality in relationship to the ECU? Well, I, I didn't tell them what to editorialize. They're in the community, and they know the pulse of the community. Now, there were, there were times when something would come out, and I'd read one and say, why did we take this position? Uh, I, I don't know whether this was in territorial, but I remember one time in Grand Island, we'd done something about uh, the, the, something about some. We, they were having a fire, and somebody had been drinking, and they ran over the fire hose, and uh, they were all upset about it out there. And the manager called me and talked to me. He says, "Gosh, I've got a call from the uh, beer distributor, and he's all over me because I took this position." I said, "So," I said, "As far as I'm concerned." Your position was the right position. It's one you should take. And if we knuckle under in our positions to advertisers, then we've lost all of our freedom. So if you take a position, stand behind it. I'll never, I will not abandon you. I, I've seen that happen in broadcasting too. And we've got, a, we've got an, uh, a, an employee here in town who was working for a television station down in Wichita, Kansas, that took a real strong position about a university down there, and his, uh, his management abandoned him, and they got rid of him, which I think is wrong. You know? So would it, be, would it be realistic to say then that, that these, the stations and the Stewart Group reflected some of your personal goals? No, uh, they might have reflected my goals, but they didn't always reflect what I would personally think. They reflected what that manager felt was best for that town that they operated in. I think my trying to set out boundaries would be wrong. Although I did do this, I did take the editorials from the different stations and bundle them up and send them out, which would might pique their 
their thought process of something they could do in their towns. Usually. Roger Larson did a real good job at KFOR, very thoughtful, insightful editorials, and I know quite frequently some of the stuff that he'd use and talk about might be apropos in Salina, Kansas, so I sent them down there for them to use. But I had a rule that you got to do that. That was one of my checklists, because if I didn't, they wouldn't get it done. What other kinds of things like that did you see where it was important for the stations to be part of the community? Well, I still got what I call a manager's manual in my office. It's about that thick, and it's all you ever needed to know about how to run a radio station. So there were all kinds of rules and checklists and stuff. I think for our on-the-air people, I would go in to the stations on frequent occasions and have a meeting with all the staff. I mean, we might have a evening meal and then I'd get up and talk to them and ask them about questions and try to get across to them how important the station was to the town and what they could do to be helpful and talk to the receptionist about when she answered that telephone that she was our voice to the outside world and not to be flippant and not to give some you know standard answer to take an interest when somebody called and they'd lost their dog had they ever lost a dog because it's such a tragic thing to that fact. Pay attention. Get the information right. Be, be helpful to them. Uh, just all those kinds of things. And I do that on a regular basis because I, I still believe that. Since you retired as president of Stuart Broadcasting, you've become a broker and selling and buying stations as, a, as an agent for the buyers and sellers. What do you, how do you assess the radio business now with the numbers of stations and as a national perspective? Well, of course, I, uh, I got kind of a little sour taste in my mouth. I'm, uh, mouth. I don't, uh, I don't condemn people or anything about what they're doing. But I, so much emphasis today is buying and selling is bottom line, and what am I going to make? And uh, the, there are few people that come along, and I, thank goodness, I've got some of those people as customers who are the kind who buy to hold and to do with rather than to buy, keep it for three years, bring it up and sell it. Although there's that's part of the business uh, is, has become a minority. Um, but most of the people today, most of them that are getting in this business are, they're entrepreneurs. They're, they're, they're people that are not broadcasters. Uh, that's not wrong if they get a broadcaster to run it and then follow his lead. But most of those people are all driven by the bottom line and by uh, projections. And, you know, we look at the market and it's going to grow and it's going to grow by 8% and the station should grow by 5%. And they put this in their, their computers and project it out for 5 to 10 years and that's the number you got to go by. And managers are hired to do that. And I tell people that I work with today that are looking for employment. I get a lot of calls about that on both sides, people who are looking and people who want. Um, and uh, I, I tell the, the, the people to be very careful about taking jobs with a company that's just bought a station and way overpaid because they're the ones that's going to have to make it successful, not the person that bought it. And I became involved about three years ago with the uh, Lyndon Johnson family of Austin, Texas. I was called by an attorney to go down there and I, I said I don't do that for a living but I've really got a first-hand opportunity to see how this works in that deal. There's a family that has been in the business for years and years and years. Uh, they had incompetent people running it and everything and in three years we've made just monstrous strides and so it was kind of funny when we first went down there, they thought I was real smart. And today, after three years, they're smarter than I am. Dick, I thank you very much for being with us today. You've given a big bit of information in a short time, and we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Enjoyed being here, Larry.